everybody. Welcome back. I'm Hillary Ramo. Tonight we're doing a live show. I have a wonderful guest joining me. His name is Phil Chavez. He's going to be talking about the changing times prophecy. He is an Apache elder, an emissary of the World Council of Elders, and he has a fabulous story to tell us tonight. Welcome, Phil. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> well, I, I think we're working on the sound because you sound kind of far away. Yeah, I guess you are. <laughs> yes, I'm <laughs> here we in go. New Mexico. We well, I just want to let everybody know that's listening tonight. We are live and we are taking calls. If you have questions for myself or for Phil, you're welcome to call in. If you have something you'd like to talk about on the air with us, that's just fine. We're both here to chat away. So, Phil, um, why not? I'm going to let you tell the listeners, everybody listening, uh, what your lineage is and what your background is. Uh, actually, on my father's side, it is Hikari Apache and Spanish. On my mother's side, it's Navajo and Spanish. So uh, that's where my ancestry comes from. Um, I've lived in uh, New Mexico all my life, the land of enchantment. And I spent 22 years in the Marine Corps and then 20 years in banking uh, and finances. Uh, when I retired from that, I wanted to do something with my life. And so I resorted to, uh, by going back to my youth and uh, my uh, ancestry. And that was, of course, the Indian way which my grandfather had taught me a lot about. So uh, I felt uh, the calling in, so to speak, because I felt drawn to it. And there was a lot of things that drew me to it. But as I started dwelling into it and really uh, looking at where I came from, I found that... uh, the truths that I had known or thought to be were not actually the truth that I that should be. Uh, of course, I knew a lot of the uh, elders in Jemez, uh, Cocheti, Santo Domingo, Isleta, and Laguna. And from the teachings, uh, I, things started to become clearer as to uh, our origins and where we were going. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of talk out there today in the world of 2012 and the the gateways that are happening and and consciousness changing, raising, expanding, however you want to put it. What are your thoughts? And I know everybody listening is anxious to hear what the elders have to say from all different cultures. Everybody's really looking for input on what the indigenous cultures are looking for as far as prophecy goes, signs go. What are your thoughts on all of it, really? What do you believe is going to happen as we move through these next few years? Well, I talk to the uh, different uh, elders from uh, uh, Guatemala, from uh, South America, Peru, Bolivia, and, of course, in my own uh, country here. The uh, We're lucky here in New Mexico that we have 19 Indian uh, pueblos along the Rio Grande, and that's not counting the other ones that are inland, away from the Rio Grande. But one thing they have in common is that they believe the time is, is here. The phase that we're going to the fifth dimension is here. Uh, the Hopis are adamant that this is the time uh, that the uh, blue casino has come in, and, of course, that Cyrus up in the sky, the blue star. And uh, that's backed up by scientific fact that uh, the Cyrus is, uh, is uh, of course, up there glaring at us from the sky. Uh, the uh, Our eastern friends, the Indians from India, uh, call it the age of enlightenment. Uh, we, of course, call it uh, uh, the day of remembrance, the moment of remembrance. Of course, we could say rememory, but it is coming down to the fact that all of them have that criteria or that uh, legends and stories that tell that this is the uh, final phase. Now, the Mayans are more precise because they mentioned 2112, uh, you know, 21 December 20, uh, 2012. But the problem is that uh, the prophecies that have been told to me by the uh, Mayan elders and the holy people from there is it is a, a change. So that's why they say it's not the end of the world. It's the end of, of that particular time, and a new time will, will commence, a new beginning. Uh, we're going to a lot of trials and tribulations, as you can tell by the constant change in the weather, the, uh, uh, the, the horrific uh, um, earthquakes we have, volcanic action in Iceland. Uh, I mean, earthquakes. We even had an earthquake here in New Mexico a couple of weeks ago, 4.3, down in the southern part of New Mexico, down Carlsberg. 
think that this is just, just telling us that Mother Change is going, Mother Earth is going through that upheaval, uh, and this happens every twenty six thousand years. They go through these upheaval. It's a cleansing for Mother Earth. People say, well, they are. Earth is going to be destroyed. We saw twenty twelve. Well, really, what it is is the Creator did not create Mother Earth to destroy it, but it did give Mother Earth. I guess in a, a, a thought process to cleanse itself because we have gone beyond that uh, time when we can clean, uh, cleanse Mother Earth. So Mother Earth is actually, in effect, cleansing herself. Hmm. So, do you believe that as uh, Mother Earth begins to, you know, rejuvenate herself, that humans and all beings that live on her also begin a similar process? Actually, we have started that process right now. It's like, uh, we're in a shift. We're a constant shift. People that are more aware, of course, can feel that and uh, consciously feel that shift. And it has started. Uh, it is going to be a new beginning. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of people have buried their heads in the sand and uh, in the, uh, like the proverbial ostrich, I guess. But in effect, it, we're in that change right now. And, and uh, there are people talk about, and there are portals. Uh, there'll be a shifting of the energies on Earth. Uh, of course, uh, the polars are going to shift. And that's a con it's been known for a long time now that the polars have been shifting. And as of, uh, uh, what is it, 10 years ago, they were at 26%. And, and because we're on a, a process of acceleration, it's probably beyond that now. And that's discussing a lot what we see here, not to mention that the beginning of 2012, we're going to get those solar flares that the scientists have been talking about, and that's just going to add to the upheaval. So, yes, I think that all of us, especially the ones that understand the changes that are coming, and, of course, uh, one of the things that people don't realize, there are portals out there, energy fields that were created by the Creator for that particular reason to, to help us as we go along. But you have to be alert to them. You have to be uh, open to that suggestion when it comes. Uh, I believe entirely that uh, a lot of the changes that we have were foretold by a lot of our, uh, our um, philosophers, Indian philosophers. So it's not something that's, uh, that we weren't aware of, but as, it, as the time becomes closer or comes closer, we would become more aware of that. Do you think that we, uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of people also feel that um, there's been such a big disconnection between themselves and nature that it's, they're having a very difficult time. I, I was talking to somebody earlier this week, actually, who really was convinced and very afraid for herself and her family that the world was going to end like it's been predicted in movies and books and, you know, kind of nurtured in that fear sense, you know, uh, that it's going to happen this way. And and uh, what, what do you have to say to the people that are listening that kind of are find themselves kind of in an in-between place with, you know, trying to figure out what's going to do? I always tell people you need to focus on living now. You know, if the, if the world ends or, you know, we happen to go through earth changes that are cataclysmic, well, you better get busy living now anyway. So, I mean, it's, it's when it's your time, it's your time. But, but when fear, how does fear change a person's experience? Well, I think what happens is it, it fear is the fear of the unknown because people don't understand or don't know what's going to happen. The thing is you have to understand that this has happened many times before. Like I said, every 26,000 years, Earth goes through this upheaval. And, and, and there's always, a, unfortunately, because of this upheaval, there's a lot of uh, uh, disruption. You have earthquakes, you have volcanoes, you have uh, this giant hurricanes, you have tsunamis. So all of this is a process of earth cleansing itself. The thing is to be prepared, not to be afraid. One thing you have to remember, you go to another dimension. It, when we die, we don't, oh, I, 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 and I think that's an incorrect term, dying. We don't die. We just go to another, uh, another dimension. We, we, our physical bodies are left behind, and our spirit goes. Our spirit never dies. It's there. So you have to embrace it. Understand, again, that Earth will not be destroyed. I said before, the Creator did not create Earth to destroy it. And one thing the Indians have always understood, our, our indigenous natives, is that Creator created everything here, 
And we have to respect everything that's on earth because it was created by the creator, including us. He gave us the thought process, uh, the right to choose as we like. But we have to respect all things on earth. That includes the wind, the creepy crawlers, and we talk about those, and the rock people, the rock and All of these were put here by the creator, and we have to respect them. We, uh, it's like uh, when you go to uh, your neighbor's house, you knock on the door, you enter. Uh, any place you go, it's a, a case of uh, being respectful. So respect everything that's around you. Um, I know that a lot of this, believe it or not, was taught to me by my son, uh, who, uh, who uh, had a great belief in animals. He loved animals, creepy colors, and everything. And he says... Everything was put here on Earth because I created yourself that there was a need for each of those little insects, animals that are here to keep the balance of nature. But because of what we've done over the centuries, cut down the wood, uh, forest, uh, uh, eliminated a lot of our animals. Uh, a couple of years ago, they killed the last jaguar in New Mexico. And New Mexico, of course, there's a lot of jaguars in Mexico and things like that, but New Mexico had their own jaguars, and a couple of years ago, the last one was killed. So by doing that, we, uh, we actually mess up our, um, our balance. And this is what Earth is trying to find right now. Uh, the Mother Earth is trying to change that around, and that doing that is a, it's a cleansing time for Mother Earth. But we need to understand, and and once you start knowing these things about Mother Earth, you will not be afraid. We need to be concerned, and we need to know what we have to do to make sure that uh, our lives continue. And we will. Earth, a God, the Creator has provided these portals or energy fields for us, and we, and these are talked about in many by many people. Uh, one of um, a gentleman, his name is Jose, he wrote a book, and he talks about being able to go back and forth to the fifth dimension. Now, a lot of people can do that. When I was growing up, my grandfather told me that there, in the beginning there was a time when uh, we could converse with our animal friends. We could converse with humans by telepathy, but we drifted away from the way the Creator had created us, and we became embarrassed. The Creator never took these gifts away. We took them away from ourselves because we became embarrassed by what we were doing. But today, there's a lot of young people that have that power because we're in the process of remembrance. We're remembering what our ancestors were able to do. And and, and it's funny because now... Uh, you, you can even, there's people out there that we call the horse whispers, the dog whispers, llama whispers, whatever you want to call them. They have the ability to to connect with these uh, animals or with other humans. So we are remembering what we have, uh, those gifts that we were given. When you talk about star nations, what does that mean to you? Well, one thing you have to remember, and this has been, if you ever watch Discovery Channel, History Channel, those channels, um, they are trying to find out how certain things were built back in the days when there was no machinery. Uh, you could go back to the base of uh, the uh, pyramids in Egypt, the ones in uh, the Aztecs, the Mayans. The Mayans, you have to remember, were probably the biggest uh, uh, nation at one time because they not only went from South America, no, they were centered in Mexico, but they went to South America a the coast, and there's islands like uh, Tio Tomas and even Puerto Rico, where there's signs of the um, of, uh, of the uh, Mayans. And and how did they build precise monuments? How did they build all that they built without machinery? There's, we cannot, we don't have machines today that can pick up those gigantic rocks and put them at a level where it is so precise you can't even stick a knife to them. This had, we had to have had how, and this had to have been done by our star people. Uh, a lot of people might scoff at the idea, but they're in South America, they're in El Alto, which is in Peru. It's over 14,000 feet. There's a new um, discovery there. When I say new, it's been the last 15 years, at Iwanaku. And there's a, uh, a, a huge, huge uh, doorway. It's, it's, uh, it's um, 
solid rock. And I was talking to one of the elders down there one time, and he told me that the hieroglyphics on that rock have not been deciphered yet. But he says if we knew how to decipher those and speak that language, we would be able to go through that uh, that door and go to another uh, country or another dimension or another uh, or another world. Because these people traveled. They're at the same place. There is a sunken um, temple, and if you were to go to the temple, you look around right in the center, there are human heads drawn of all the uh, types of uh, races and cultures uh, in the world at that time. Now, how did they know how these people looked unless they traveled? And mm. uh, how did they travel? Uh, that has to be the only way they could do it, with the portals or uh, with our star people. So people can scoff at the idea if they want to, but it's a known fact and then uh, why the government tries to keep it from us, I have no idea, uh, because there's signs every day about the star, our, our uh, relatives out in the skies. Where did we come from? The, yes, God created us, but he not, this, we can't be egotistical enough uh, or so much that we can't believe that there are other planets that have humans in it or a type of uh, living being. So I believe that we were giving, uh, given help to produce this gigantic, beautiful uh, pyramids and cultures that existed way before. Uh, think about the Mayans. The Mayans could read the stars. The stars. They were so precise in their in their uh, readings of the stars that they uh, they were able to predict. Uh, years and years and centuries ahead of uh, of uh, what we know today. There are places in Mexico in the pyramids where if you threw a glass of water on the floor, oh, that that water would spread evenly on that floor, evenly. That's how level the, the uh, that uh, buildings were. So I, did we have that technology? No, but we were given help to do it. So I believe that that came from our star, uh, our star uh, uh, friends. Now, a while back, I had sent you uh, a book um, by Wayne Herschel, and it, it talked about the alignments for most of the major, a lot of the major sites in the world that align to the Pleiades. And I thought that you would particularly find that book interesting because of our conversations prior, uh, back in the summertime when we were in Santa Fe together. And uh, I, I'm curious because we really haven't had too many conversations since. Uh, what you've thought of oh, well, that, the, the, and what, what is the I, significance of that constellation? Well, that's yeah, the, that's of the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the book that you're talking about with Hidden Records mm -hmm. yes. uh, by Wayne Herschel, I found it very interesting because one of the reasons that uh, we're doing what we're doing right now, uh, we're going to Hawaii on a pilgrimage on uh, the 6th uh, of uh, April, and uh, Hawaii is the basis of this triangle that actually goes to uh, Tibet and Egypt. Now, I'll be going to Egypt, and I believe you're going with me in October. We're yes, going with you. Yes, we are. We're yeah. going to Hawaii, too. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> now, there is a, uh, there, there, the elders have told us that we have to uh, have ceremonies at this place because at this place is because this is where the energies lie. There are some of the safe havens that they talk about. But the book that I'm talking uh, that we were talking about, the Hidden Records, it actually goes into depth in, in, in what's happening and how uh, the stars, and now you have to remember, uh, Egypt at the time when uh, it was at its heyday, they were uh, they weren't so much predicting that they were doing, they were doing what the Mayans were doing, but in a different way. We were all reaching the same uh, uh, conclusion. Matter of fact, the Indians from India. There is a culture there that has the same kind of philosophy as the um, as the Mayans, but not as precise. Now, what's funny about the Egyptians is that they had uh, they had the Pleiades, which is uh, the Indians like to call the sisters. And I think you, uh, uh, Hillary, I think you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so, uh, and so the, um, that the um, the Pleiades plays a big deal in how the Earth was actually created during the time when, I guess, when the uh, 
uh, I like to say the mammoths and the uh, saber-toothed tigers uh, uh, were roaming back then before we had another upheaval. Uh, if you ever have a chance, you have to read in depth, and you might not be able to do it um, the one time. You, you're going to have to read that book uh, two or three times because you, you can't catch it all on the first on the first read. You have to read it. But uh, when I got that book, how? I read it really quick the first time, and I had to go back again because there were so many things in there that I did not understand the first time. Because you have the star maps uh, that that are in there, it tells you how uh, how the things are aligning. Because on 2012, one of the things that's going to happen, and he was in hidden records there, is that the moon and the sun are going to align, and that's just and Mercury are going to align. So this is the first time that'll happen in I thought. Uh, 19, 26,000 years, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. So part of it has to do with the fact that the, the, the star or the gods of the stars, I guess I could say, this was a big creation. And somehow the Egyptians, I don't know if you ever look at Egyptians, they, the ones that were called the gods, they call themselves the gods. But if you look at them, they look like the humans, like all of us. But if you look at them closer, they are, they are different than the rest of us. Why? Because yeah. these people were star people. Yeah, this yeah. People, they were star people. And also, in all those civilizations from back then, there's one thing that people overlook. If you look at those hieroglyphics, there's people that look like star people, like what people like to say as aliens. But this was found in, uh, we can find them in Sedona in the hieroglyphics here. You can go to South America, you find them there. And even our natives here, even our natives here in New Mexico, believe that the, that the, the, our star people exist, even today. So by reading that, uh, the hidden records, you can actually start realizing some of the things that um, uh, I think, I'm trying to think of the name of that, uh, and, and core, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, N-K or G-K-O-R, and core, and uh, but you also, you have to remember that a lot of these things that uh, we talk about is interpretation. But all you have to do is go in there and read, and you find about the Pleiadian gods, um, about how they came about. Uh, and you'll see the hieroglyphics on the pyramids in Egypt. And how, how did they know about this? How did they know? How did they have that knowledge? They studied a lot of the, the stars, but how did they get this? Uh, how did they acquire this knowledge? Somebody had to have helped them do that. They just didn't wake up one day and say, "Hey, well, this is the way we do it." So we had to have had help from our, our star uh, our star relatives. Um, one of the things that uh, Sal tells me that, uh, and he's in, of course, uh, Sal is one of our elders from Genes Pueblo is the fact that uh, we have become too egotistical because even though we were created and came from Earth, as the Indians believe, there was another power involved later on as we came along to, to help us with our uh, learning process of how to survive on Earth. And uh, some of our other relatives were way, way ahead of us, like the Mayans, the Aztecs, the uh, Incas, the Egyptians. Uh, and you can go back and trace those uh, from the first uh, humans, supposedly, that came out of Africa. Uh, so this, this all had a basis from our star friends. And even today, yeah, people talk about spaceships and, of course, in Roswell, the crashing of uh, of. Um, the well-known spaceship in, in Roswell, but people don't understand that not long after what happened in Roswell, uh, along the same area, a few years later, there was another crash that's not talked about. Uh, Dulce Mountain here in uh, in uh, New Mexico, which is uh, the Hikaria Apache Reservation, uh, if you go into Dulce, New Mexico, and you, he'll come up and he'll tell you a lot of what's going on, that, that sacred mountain of the uh, Hikaria Apaches. And in 1967, there was a, a small battle there. And that initially they said it was uh, with the Indians and the uh, uh, government. But in actuality, it was uh, with our uh, alien friends, or star people, and our earthlings uh, for control of how to do certain things. And that mountain was hollowed out. And there's a lot of places, if you go down and that, that uh, mountain is so hollowed out that it goes down 20, 30, 40, 50 stories. And from there it branches out and it goes out to Arizona, to southern New Mexico. Uh, so 
They have been here for a long time. Uh, if you read a lot about the Lemurians, the Atlanteans, uh, we talk about Mount Shasta. The Hawaiians, that's another reason why we're going. The Hawaiians were descendants of the Lemurians, of the Atlanteans. And that place is the central place for this triangle that I'm talking about that goes through Egypt. And that we'll find a lot of our answers when we leave Hawaii and more of our answers when we visit Egypt. Uh, some of them, like I said, the triangle actually heads to Tibet, uh, where there's, uh, uh, there is something happening there. Uh, there is big energy source there, uh, just like there is at, uh, at uh, Pecos here in New Mexico. Pecos uh, is a ruins of the Indians here, and there's a big energy field there. And but in order to understand this, you have to read uh, or have to go back to the days of the uh, Egyptians, the Mayans, the Aztecas, to know what the Bakers are, uh, mm -hmm. because some of these people that came from uh, that are that and Pecos actually came from uh, the uh, uh, from Mexico. So when somebody goes to a place like this, what what is it that they experience exactly? What, in your words, what what is the purpose and, and point of somebody going physically to these places at this time to experience them? Uh, if you go as a tourist, you're going to see beautiful, sacred places. But if you go as someone uh, for the intention of opening up your energy fields to because you're undergoing some shifts. Uh, I think most of us that understand our shifts, we understand our energy, how it's shifting within our bodies. What we go to is to is to let the our ancestors know, the grandfathers, the the holy people know that have passed way on uh, centuries ago that we are there, that we understand their teachings, that we are there to do ceremony to help us open up those portals, those energy fields, uh, to learn more, to, uh, to make ourselves more available. Not all, see, what's happening is, is we think too much sometimes. We think too much. My son used to say, you know, uh, let your heart do the thinking. Let your heart do the thinking because that way sometimes it's better to let that emotion uh, do your, be your guide. And, and then, like I used to say also that you can, with, uh, with your heart you can see, with the light of your heart you can see even in the dark. So by going and doing ceremony uh, in these sacred places, we're opening ourselves up to receive what our ancestors wants us, uh, want us to receive. The knowledge uh, that we have been, or we've had all this many uh, centuries, just got away from and forgot about. They're reopening our memories. They're, uh, we're relearning what we already knew from what we had lost. And by going to these sacred places, we are opening ourselves up to that, to know more about what's going to happen and how we can deal with it. And the intention of the ceremonies is to do what at this point? So, it's, it's like, uh, the, the, just like I said, the, the purpose of these ceremonies is, is actually, in a way, twofold. One is to, again, alert our ancestors that we come to honor them, to honor them for their uh, knowledge and to get back that knowledge that we have lost. That's one, that's one reason. The other one is to, uh, I think, for us to become more more familiar with our spirits, with our energy, with our shift that, that started, the shift that, that has started now, actually started way before, but we're becoming more aware of it now. And so what we're doing is honoring our ancestors, honoring what, they, uh, what uh, they brought to us, the, uh, the teachings that we had gotten away from of how to treat Mother Earth, and at the same time to get this energy that they're willing to give us. And, uh, and a lot of us have different reasons. A lot of us have been searching for something. A, a lot of times, I think that when I was a child, from the time I was a child, my main getaway was by reading. I was searching for something, uh, and I still did not know. It took me a long time. I, I'm 64 now, and it's only about six years ago that I found out what I've been searching for. There was something missing in my life. There was always, some, always something different. Um, 
I always believed in uh, uh, people from outer space. I, of course, at the time, uh, like anybody else, I called them uh, aliens, but in fact, they were the star people. So we are all doing it for different reasons that we're searching. We're coming to the same place for the same reasons, only we are arriving there differently. Uh, and what we're doing is energy. Um, Self-help me. When people come together for the same reason, that becomes a sacred place, and that makes the gods happy or the creator happy. I hope I've answered that question. But I oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I, I think you do. I think it's great. I'm just taking it all in. It's uh, really an honor to be part of that. Now, when uh, do you think that people feel a calling inside of themselves to participate in these things? What, a lot of times, um, you know, I've had conversations with people, and they want to go, but they just – don't something stops them what do you think what do you think most people find as their main resistance to participating in these things i think it's uh, the idea that some people will ridicule them and uh, it brings to mind that movie uh if i can remember oh uh close encounters of the third kind see people were awakening and they were all getting the same feeling and they were searching for that. They couldn't understand what was going on. Well, see, that's what's happening today. That a lot of that is happening today. People are waking up, and they feel that they have, there might be they might have uh, uh, beautiful homes, have good jobs, they have beautiful families, but they still feel something lacking, something missing, and they don't know, and they don't know enough about what's going on out there. That all of a sudden something strikes. I have a friend. Her name is Jerry Scully from uh, Albany, Georgia. She's in her seventies. And and all of a sudden she started having this feeling. She had been to New Mexico once before, and then she came again, and and uh, she always had this that something missing. Well, now she knows what was missing: the fact that uh, she did not understand all the, the wantings, the earnings in her heart, and uh, that had to do with coming back and realizing that way. Hey, hey uh, there's some things that I have to do to 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 get back in touch with Mother Earth. So yes, all of us, uh, and, and all of us have that, but some of us are more open to the suggestions. We're not intimidated by what by people think. I have always spoken out if I felt in my heart that what I said was my truth, and that was that I believed in other humans or other beings from other worlds, that I believed in certain things because even though we didn't see them face to face, I believed that they were there. And uh, so I think it's not being afraid. First off, you have to remember that you're not the only one that feels that way. There's a lot of people like you that feels that way, that uh, you need to take that step either by calling somebody, emailing somebody. Uh, we have a lot of groups uh, that if you email them, they will respond immediately just to let you know that there's more than one person that feels the same way. Or pick up the phone and talk to somebody. And we have a lot of people that have come to us just like that, that were searching for something, and they feel now that uh, they haven't quite found it, they're on the right path. <clears throat> you know, uh, you also, we're talking to Phil Chavez, for those of you uh, listening or have just joined us, and we're discussing prophecy, uh, pilgrimage, and uh, 2012, star nations, lots of wonderful things. Phil, you're also involved with a project, uh, a sanctuary that you, you and uh, other people are collaborating on with purchasing to create a place um, for people to go and experience uh, community. Would you care to share uh, some of that project? Yes, uh, the uh, project's name is Tanashkada. That is an Apache name, meaning people coming together. It is a sanctuary where uh, we'll have our uh, famous potters from Hermes Pueblo teaching pottery. We'll have people teaching herbs of the land, how t those herbs are used for, what they're good for, what they're used for, and also teaching culture, the history of the land, uh, teaching how uh, um, uh, 
building of, out of um, Mother Earth, how to build out of Mother Earth without having to resort to all these high saluting things that uh, Mother Earth has provided us with those building materials. So we'll teach the natural way of, of, uh, of building. Uh, there'll be a lot of teachings. There'll be a lot of uh, showing uh, the field trips and things like that, having people come that, uh, that have problems. We have a lot of different types of healers, uh, and we have a big organization. We have different types of healers, and they're there for that reason. They're not there to, uh, to question what to do, just to ask. They're there to help you. So this sanctuary is 191 acres called Tanashkada. It's 13 miles north of La Vegas, New Mexico. It is situated beautifully at the, at the base of a, a mountain there. And it is really, really beautiful. So we're trying to purchase that property, and all for the right reasons, because we feel that we need those communities. Now, my job as an emissary of both uh, Tanashkada and the World Council of Elders is to glue this uh, organization together. By that, I mean it's networking where we understand that all of us are doing uh, the same thing, basically, and so we need help. We need some expertise from their their uh, uh, units, and they might need our expertise from our units. I helped start another organization called Hamatsa. Hamatsa is a Santo Domingo word that means a place coming to be. And so uh, these are organizations that started for the very basic reason of trying to uh, teach people how to survive, how to, how to uh, uh, use what Mother Nature has provided for us. We're trying to use what uh, provided by the fund, solar. Uh, once we purchase this property, everything will be turned into what we believe Mother Earth is helping us with, solar or wind power. Uh, our buildings will be constructed from uh, earth uh, building materials like adobe, that sort of thing. I actually teach Adobe Building, too. Um, so this is what we're trying to create. And uh, and it is very important as we draw closer to 2012, we need to know when to plant, how to plant, what to plant, and when to harvest. And these are all very important things. A lot of people don't understand that, that what farmers do and, uh, and, and uh, when is the right uh, time to plant. What can be planted at certain uh, locations and altitudes? And how often do you water? What do you need to, to make sure that uh, these products are produced? And then once it's finalized, when do you harvest? It's also very important. So these are the things that we teach. We teach people how to do that so that they can become self-reliant uh, and self-sufficient. Really basic skills. I mean, if we did have some kind of cataclysm or, you know, earth changes where we had drastic changes to our lifestyles, a lot of people couldn't answer those questions. They wouldn't know where to start without grocery stores, would they? No, look at what happened to Haiti. Haiti is, uh, the whole country was just about devastated. And, of course, a lot of the countries in the world have got together and are helping it. Uh, but it's important that this be, it's like uh, the old saying say, you, you give somebody fish and he'll be able to eat for the day. But if you teach him how to fish, he'll be able to, uh, to feed himself and his family. So teaching people the basic skills, and they might, you might call them survival skills if you want that, but re in reality, it's skills that our forefathers had. They traveled across this country. They survived in covered wagons and all that because they knew what, uh, how to plant. They knew what to plant. They knew what to harvest. Uh, and these are important skills that we need, knowing uh, how to uh, can uh, your, your fruits or your vegetables so that you can have some for the winter. These are all basic skills that are being taught, that we're trying to teach. And like I said, our Indian elders are more than happy uh, to teach. Uh, they, they, they don't want to waste the knowledge that they have because you have to remember one thing. The Indian has always taught the same thing over and over again. They have relied on themselves. They're the ones that are really way ahead of us right now. We had a catastrophe that uh, they, they, would, they would already have uh, their foods so they will already know what to plant, what to plant, mm -hmm. and we would be lost. Yeah. So, I'm curious what you think about the genetic modification of crops such as corn, um, soy. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts on uh, big business getting into genetically altering plants? Well, when you do that, guess what it does? Because we're eating that food, it also alters us. That. That's, that's happening in animals. Uh, I was in South America, and... Uh, 
and uh, I was there for about six uh, weeks. I actually, I went on on a trip for myself. I had been. I, I do a lot of work for uh, an organization called Seeds of Learning. We build schools in third world countries. Well, well, this time I just went to visit friends. I didn't go work. I just went to relax and get fat and sassy. Uh, but I ate three meals a day, which I haven't done since I was in the service in the Marine Corps. I ate three meals a day every day. And guess what? I lost 10 pounds. And I'm talking to my friend from uh, uh, La Paz, and I says, hey, what's going on? He says, you are eating food that has not been tainted. He says, you're eating meats that don't have, like in America, where they throw all that down, they give the, uh, our, our uh, cows or, uh, you know, shots. Uh, hormone shots and everything else to get them fat and big and, and uh, so they can produce more meat. Well, down there they eat you know, just uh, natural foods uh, and the meat is so good. And let me, you don't see a lot of fat people uh, in, in, in South America. You don't. Because these people are eating natural foods. They're produced naturally. I had, I went to this marketplace and they had like, I, 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 I don't know, 34 types of potatoes. Uh, and they were all organically grown. They weren't, uh, they didn't use all this other stuff that they used to produce like they do in America. We have gotten to the point where uh, you never know what you're going to eat. Everything that we eat is bad for you. A doctor finds something bad for each food that we eat uh, on a daily basis because we are not eating the correct organic foods like uh, our, our, our grandfathers did. So I believe that if we went back to that, we would be a lot healthier, and uh, and, uh, and our foods would be uh, could be produced organically. And if everybody uh, planted their own food and grew their own food, uh, that would be the like here in Pasitas, here where I live. I have certain friends that do their own, uh, they have their own gardens, and their food is all oh, you can always taste the difference because theirs are organically grown, not like the ones you buy at the store. Do you feel that um, our genetics, uh, I'm sure over the, the you know centuries since our ancestors were doing this, we have significantly altered our genetic systems. Do you believe that that affects our ability to communicate interdimensionally? I think that uh, I think that in a sense, yes. But I also believe that my uh, elders have told. That we're on the the phase, the final phase, and that we're on also on the remembrance, the time of remembrance. So a lot of these, if we're open to it, if we're open to it, we'll be able to, as we go along, by the time 2012 comes along, because we're also in the stage of acceleration, that we'll be able to communicate with our uh, our animal friends, uh, with with humans, uh, where we don't have to shout at somebody. We can just uh, telepathically send a, a message. Thing. Uh, so, but there was a time I think with our uh, with our star people, like the Egyptians, uh, and that's what they call themselves gods because they were able to communicate with uh, the star people. Uh, but in effect, I think all people would have been uh, would have been able to do that. But these were the people that were chosen uh, to communicate with the star people. So consequently, they were the ones that that uh, passed the word on to uh, the peons, if you want to say that. Uh, so, no, I, I think that we still have that ability, but we just don't know how to use it yet. Mm. So we're remembering how to use it then. We're waking that back up. Uh -huh. uh, there's uh, one of our group, uh, I'm not sure if you met her on our pilgrimage, uh, Stacy. I'm not sure if you, yeah, I think, no, no, Stacy wasn't with us on our pilgrimage. Well, Stacy has a seven-year-old child that has shown many, many signs of, of being able to converse telepathically. And, 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 uh, I'm sorry, the kids ahead. are coming. The kids, the kids are definitely coming in um, with higher senses and and different abilities that I think a lot of us are noticing. And and uh, I think sometimes we're quick to also diagnose those things as different kinds of um, disorders, you know, that really don't necessarily fit. With the kids that have more enhanced abilities, or you know, dreamers, or they're, they're avid dreamers, they come in, they you know, they communicate with other dimensions, and you know, sometimes I think we write that off as certain um, disorders. You know, another question I wanted to ask you, Phil, is um, 
what you think, I mean, we only have, we're in the last few minutes of the show, and I know this is probably a big topic to bring up right now, but, and you've touched on it a bit with the Star Nation topic, but one of the things I've always wondered in the pictures of cultures across the board is the extended skull pictures that you see. You know, the elongated head, you had that in South America, people would actually kind of wrap their skulls to grow their heads, uh, like egg-shaped, you know, or to, to mold them. In Egypt, you have pictures of uh, pharaohs or, or different kinds of people with these elongated heads. Do you believe that they were uh, depicting the star people? That's exactly what they were. If in fact, they were not the star people themselves. But they, they knew that the star people, they thought that they were gods, so because of the power and the intelligence that they had, so they wanted to be like them. But they only wanted them to be like the pharaohs wanted to be like that because they wanted to create themselves as gods. But in fact, maybe a, a lot of them were probably star people. But yes, those, those heads uh, portray our, our star people that came down. And, uh, and there's always a basis to something. They're always the basis uh, that the, uh, the cultures, the stories that I've been told from by, by the Indians. Uh, my grandfather used to tell me a lot of the stories, and and now as I grew up and I started going back, I find that the pueblos have basically the same kind of stories my grandfather had. Uh, so the thing is that all the Indians have always uh, taught the same things, and it was always by word of mouth. So every night when they had storytelling, they would repeat the same stories over and over and over again so that people could remember them. And the same thing, I guess, with the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Incas, uh, is that they had they had this power and they wanted to be God, and they probably were the ones that the um, star people chose as their interpreters or the people to, to uh, convey the messages. So they wanted to look like these powerful beings. So they would wrap their heads or form their heads or steal babies. You know, so where the where the head is more pliable at the time, and they would uh, make them look like that. But in effect, who knows? Some of them might have been in the star people themselves. Mm. So in stories, when we talk about stories, it, there's a benefit then in looking at our past and the stories that come out of the indigenous cultures because they hold a lot of our true history. Then, right? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, and I'm uh, looking at them. Uh, and if you put, if you look, if you were to take all the indigenous stories that you find, there's always, they always seem the same. Just, they have a different name and a different locality. But the, the way, uh, because they all seem from the same place. But the stories were told differently, but with the same basis. And just like they say, well, uh, in a way, the Indians are a little bit like the Israelis, that they, be, they believe in Jesus Christ, but only in the fact that he was a prophet. See, the Indians honor everything, but they only pray to the Creator. And they believe that there was a man named Jesus Christ that appeared to the Indians here way before Columbus set foot uh, in, uh, on this new world. And that's why the Indians were so uh, friendly when Columbus came uh, came ashore, because they had this story had been foretold from uh, from centuries ago. That a man had appeared to the Indians and told them he was in long flowing uh, gown, uh, blonde hair, and uh, really light complexion, and told them to to get ready for the coming of the white man. And so they were ready for them. Now, they believe that that meant to be Jesus Christ, but they believe him to be a prophet, not necessarily uh, like uh, the Christians believe that he is the Son of God, but they believe him to be a good man. They, so that's for the reason why they only pray to the Creator. There are no other gods before. To them, only the Creator. The Creator is all-powerful. Uh, so these stories have always been passed down. Again, the same thing. It's uh, word of mouth, and it's been something that has been uh, uh, stories told every night, the same stories, but uh, told time and time again. And normally the teachings were done by the grandparents because the parents were, of course, uh, the younger ones, and they were all doing hunting or whatever had to be done to uh, to keep up the household. Now, Phil, you travel to teach uh, if people or groups want to bring you in to facilitate or speak to a group. You are available to do so. How would people get in touch with you to do that? Uh, they would have to, uh, they can go to my uh, 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 either to uh, Tanashkara website because I have a little uh, one in there, uh, or they can even uh, uh, 
email me. Uh, I'm, I, in, uh, in May, I'll be going to Albany to give three classes, uh, the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th. And then I'm supposed to go on a TV show, but I'm not sure what the date on that one. And I'm doing another uh, radio show uh, in New York. So there's a lot of things happening, and they want me to, to, to talk about the things that we, we're trying to get the word out to people. We're trying to get them to let know that there are organizations uh, like us everywhere that uh, are looking to help people, to teach, uh, uh, to instruct, uh, to just to, to get together uh, people of like uh, thinking, because we need those people as we go along. Mm, and if people are interested who are listening and would like to make a donation to the property, um, there is a banner on AchieveRadio.com's homepage and also on my website, HillaryRamo.com, and you can go to the direct website also. And even, you know, $5, $10 doesn't have to be a lot of money. Just give something. It, it gives a good energy to the cause. If you can give a lot, great, because I believe in the cause myself and have contributed also. Um, Phil, and what I'd like to do in the last few minutes of the show, and what I asked my guests to do is to consider a message that they would like to share with everybody listening. Um, the wonderful thing about radio is it's like a ripple, and it just kind of continues out across the world, think, thankfully to the Internet. What is your message that you really want people to know now? I have a native prayer for peace that we say. It's a native prayer for peace that I translated into English. And it only takes a couple of seconds to, to say it out, so I'll go ahead and do that. Great spirit of our ancestors, I raise my pipe to you, to the messengers for the four winds, and to Mother Earth who provides for your children. Give us wisdom to teach our children to love, to respect, and to be kind to each other so that they may grow with peace in mind. Let us learn to share all good things that you provide for us on this earth. Aho. With those words, we thank very much you for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Phil. It's, it's your brother in my own heart, and I look forward to seeing you in a few days in Hawaii and working with you and walking the sacred sites and the land. Um, thanks so much for joining me tonight. And thank you for having me. Everybody listening, I send you much love and excitement, and I'll be back again, a uh, live show uh, at the end of the month of April. We'll have archives running between now and then. Um, but I'll be, have lots of stories to tell and hopefully share with you. You can also follow me along on Facebook. I'm there posting pictures and sharing our updated journeys throughout the day as we walk through the lands of Hawaii. And um, on my website also there will be updates. Thanks for joining me, everyone. I'm Hillary Ramo. 